Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our community budget meeting this evening. Um, my name is Kimberly Roaring. I'm Deputy Superintendent for Business and Finance, and I will be chairing the meeting this evening. Um, we are pleased to welcome several of our members, Ms. Brown, uh, Ms. Zimmerman, and uh, oh my goodness, I'm going to forget your last name, Dahlia, our wonderful Dahlia. Um, so if we can get started with slide two, please. Our agenda this evening will include an uh, update on our budget process, our rollover expense adjustments and updated cost drivers, a discussion on community priorities, a review of our tax cap calculation as it sits currently, and then at the end we will be providing some responses to committee questions that were received by email in between meetings. The board will receive their next budget update on March 3rd. Uh, we will have our virtual community budget presentation on March 24th, where we will be interactive with the community, uh, answering questions as they come in. We will present the superintendent's proposed budget on April 7th. We anticipate adoption on April 14th, and then there will be a series of virtual community budget presentations after that, leading up to the vote on May 17th. As a review, our, this year we have what we are referring to as a modified rollover budget. The assumptions of a rollover budget include continuation of existing programs and services, contractual obligations, operations, and staffing and benefits under our labor contracts. A modified rollover budget includes the above plus absorption of programs and staffing funded by one-time federal funds. It does not include any new funding or staffing requests submitted for 22-23, addressing mandates that require more resources or other items considered to be essential programming for essential for programming health and safety. Our 22-23 modified rollover budget adjustments include renewing our HVAC preventive maintenance contract, funding a pool maintenance contract for the five pools across the district, uh, re extended day night school funded restored to 2019-20 levels pre-pandemic, we have added some behavior specialists and social worker positions during the 21-22 year to respond to SEL needs of our students. We also added some mandated nursing positions to comply with regulatory ratios, and we have added some additional equipment funds for security and maintenance. Additionally, the rollover budget adjustments include increasing software licenses to build those in that were previously funded by grants and have been woven into the fabric of our instructional program. Increase for our technology hardware to support the Chromebook replacement schedule now that we are a one-to-one -one district and increasing our funding for hall monitor and maintenance over time to support after school programming and facilities use as we return to more typical uh, programming and use in 22-23. Modified rollover adjustments since we um, Last met include employees retirement system, employer contribution rate adjustment, adjustments to positions, including those absorbed from one time federal dollars, uh, adjustments in our BOCES expenditures that are based on updated rate information and tuition from them. Um, we have switched summer school to uh, grants for summer of 22, so that has been removed from our modified rollover budget. And we have been learned from the governor's budget proposal that our charter school tuition rate increase estimated originally at 5% is expected to be 4.7. So we have made that corresponding adjustment as well. That brings our modified rollover expense budget to 287, dollars $287, which is a difference of 17.3 million or 6.4%. The figures above do again, do not include funding of any new staffing uh, requests submitted for 22-23, any additional items that may address mandates, or additional items considered essential to programming health and safety. Reviewing cost drivers of the modified rollover budget, we've had a decrease in our overall benefit uh, number year over year. Uh, we are now anticipating an increase of 1.9 million. We are anticipating a, debt, a decrease in our debt service of about 296,000, 296, pardon me. We have made some adjustments in our salary projections for next year, including uh, additional eight, eight ESL positions, nine custodial worker positions, and at this time we are planning the absorption of approximately 83 positions from one-time federal dollars. That gives us a year-over-year -year increase of 8.3. It's important to note that that also includes our contractual salary increases as obligated in our collective bargaining agreements. This reflects the shift of summer school into grants again for summer of 22. This also reflects the uh, adjustments that we've received from BOCES. 
Um, and we've broken out to reflect the increase in equipment for both maintenance and security. Uh, you'll see the slight decrease in charter school tuition, and that is reflective of the 4.7 rather than the 5% increase in tuition rate. And then we have showed a couple of other categories um, this time around, including other tuition expense, which is a private and public placement, and transportation, the contractual increases we have with our providers. Totaling that $17.3 million year over year increase, which is actually a decrease of $633,000 from our original modified budget. The governor's proposal included $2.1 billion increase in education funding. 1.6 billion of that was dedicated to foundation aid increases and 466 million for other programming. We are in year two of a three year path to fully funding foundation aid. We are continuing the community school set aside in the foundation aid for Albany, that's about 4.4 million. The governor's proposal also fully funds expense-based aid, such as transportation, public and private access cost, building aid, and BOCES aid. Continuation of all categorical aids at the same per student allocation, charter school tuition rate increase of 4.7%. And this new program that she has proposed of $100 million over two years, matching funds for social, emotional, and academic supports for students. The district would be obligated to match with ARP funds, and we are waiting to see if this becomes part of the fully executed budget for 22-23 and then what the guidance around that program may be. Again, our revenue comes in four areas. Our local revenue primarily comprised of property taxes, but also including taxes on consumer utilities and payment in lieu of taxes. Our state aid comes as star reimbursement, foundation aid, categorical aid, and BOCE special services aid. Federal aid comes via Medicaid assistance and E-rate, and our other category is interest earnings, billings for non-resident students, tuition and use, appropriated fund balance and reserves, and rebates and refunds associated with our health insurance program. At this time, we are estimating our revenue based on the governor's proposed budget to be $285.9 million for next year, which is a year over a year increase of $15.6 million. At this time, that does continue to assume the use of restricted reserves and appropriated fund balance at $3 million and a flat property tax levy. When we look at the revenue estimate by source, we'll see the significant increase in state aid for next year of $15.3 million, largely attributed to the increase in foundation aid, an increase anticipated in our Medicaid reimbursement of $430,000, that uh, estimated aid is based on where we look to end this fiscal year uh, based on Medicaid reimbursement. And then we have a slight reduction in tuition and rental billings for that year over year increase of 15.6 million. When we compare our initial revenue with our modified rollover expense, we have a difference at this time of 1.6 million or a gap of 1.67 million. Our budget variables continue to be our state aid, which is typically not finalized until the end of March. Our health insurance increases, which are finalized later in March. The tax cap, which will be submitted by March 1st, and the levy that is set by the board and when they adopt the budget in April. We are also continuing to analyze the impact of retirements. We have been notified of 41 retirements for next year at this time. Are there any questions on any of that information? Uh, yeah, Scalia, I just want to be very, just clarify for me. So in this rendition compared to the last time we saw it, you now have absorbed 83 positions that were originally federally funded. Is that right? So this rendition does show um, what we have absorbed in terms of one-time positions. There's been a slight adjustment in that number from the previous share. Um, there's also eight SEL positions that have been added in the 21-22 fiscal year that are being carried into 22-23. Um, and there are nine custodial worker additions planned for 22-23 that are reflected in that number as well. And that is to address the additional square footage that we will have at Albany High School, North Albany, and Arbor Hill primarily. One of the things you're going to discuss is this relationship between ARP and our state budget ask. I mean, I'm assuming that the 
this is a little bit of a balancing game because by shifting over those positions, that frees you a little bit. I understand that it's a time limited uh, grant by the feds, but but that's something we'll be discussing as we move along. Um, yes, I anticipate we'll have some additional information on that going uh, into our next meeting. I would also note that for the 2021-22 year, we had access to SERISA and ARP funds, and we did um, allocate our full allotment for SERISA as part of our 21-22 budget, and that those funds then would be exhausted going into 22-23. Um, and the guidance for how we could use the SERSA funds was a little bit different than how we can use the ARP dollars. So as we look at going into 22-23 to sustain the positions that were built into SERSA, we have to bring this into the general fund um, in almost every single case. And then we can revisit ARP and what positions in ARP may be able to be renewed for a second year and what positions would need to come into the general fund to sustain those positions for 22-23. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on this portion of the presentation? Okay. Um, one of the other, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, um, are we, in this portion of the presentation, are you only asking for questions relating to exactly what was covered or are you also asking about this current slide which, that says priorities for spring 22? Um, what we've discussed to get to this point, and then I will introduce this topic. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the next thing we wanted to cover in our agenda this evening was around the community priorities. So in spring of 2021, the district did a survey of our community in terms of what the priorities were, as well as heard very clearly from the community budget committee what the priorities of the community were. And those included social emotional learning supports for students, academic acceleration, upgrades to our HVAC system, and safety and security. Um, we have uh, identified those as priorities last year. They continue to be priorities going into 22, 23. And we just wanted to take a minute to um, review those priorities and see kind of what the committee's thoughts were around that. And if there were areas of emphasis um, beyond that, or even within those four categories, if there are areas that uh, you think we may need to revisit as we go into 22-23. Okay, my only question here, and I don't know if it even is a question. I know that the, one of the highest priorities we have uh, relates to um, to racial equity and our anti-racism agenda. Um, and I know that it is integrated into the curriculum and into everything that we do. My question is, do we need any extra money for that? And is it any part of what you see here like an academic acceleration? I would, um, good evening everyone, and my apologies for coming in and, and uh, jumping in a little bit late. Uh, but uh, to address that question, uh, what I'm gonna say is we have numerous supports for different types of equity, and we understand that, and you're absolutely right. While the focus um, at its core, when we talk about equity is about those racial disparities, um, it does filter over into other things that that happen within the school district and, and not just in the school district, in society. Because when you talk about social justice, it's not just um, racial and ethnic social justice. It's all that goes into it, healthcare disparity, unemployment, um, food insecurity. I mean, all of those things have an equity component to it. And so what we have done, and I think you can see that in our programming throughout all the things that we do to address those types of things. Um, we even have workforce development that we utilize to help our families get employment. That that addresses that job insecurity piece. Uh, when we talk about the food pantries that we work alongside and how we work with, with Haddis um, with our backpack program for food, when we shift into gear, I think those things are evident. When we shift into gear, for example, during the summer, we still provide food for our families. 
Um, usually if we are in remote learning, there's some type of pickup of food that we still consider because we look at those um, food insecurities and things like that. Um, those things are already baked into our budget and we increase those dollars as needed within our budget for the next year. So that would be in some of the, and, and we may not be able to produce that for you, but that, but you have to have that security and knowing that because it is a part of our program, those are things that we're not going to lose. We're just not going to, we're not going to cut them from our budget. Um, but, and as we look to increase those resources in those areas, that is what we do. Um, when we look at, um, you know, the equity pieces that we see with regard to um, mental health, and when we look at our social, emotional, and learn our learning supports for students, all of those are baked into programming. And so that's where you'd have to go and um, separate document, but still as we merge those positions from our ARP budget that we have utilized all of not all of those positions, but we have identified some priority positions that we're looking at rolling over into the general fund so that we can sustain them over time. And as you know, the ARP money ends in September of 2024. There will be things that are truly one time that will fall off, but there are also things that we have strategically looked at from last year to this year incorporating that into the general fund so that we have sustainability from this year to next year incorporating that into the general fund and then next year we'll be in the same position because we have looked at it long range what is it that our general fund can absorb as we receive the increased foundation aid how do we roll those things over to the general fund so that we can continue to address equity? I did want to take a little bit of time and talk about the priorities for spring 2022. Um, we just developed those priorities from our uh, surveys last year. And as you know, we can't go willy nilly drop this, start this. We can't do that because that's not number one, it's not instructionally sound. Number two, it's not fiscally sound. And we have done our projections of our ARP dollars, roughly the three years out that we're receiving those funds based on those priorities. Uh, where we are right now, those priorities are not changing. In our data, we're seeing that those are the same priorities that we will look to continue with um, for the next school year and the use of all of our APR, APR money. Is that right? No, ARP money, sorry. All the acronyms, get them all mixed up sometimes. Uh, but we will um, continue with the same priorities uh, moving forward in 2022 and through the 2023 school year because that's where we have the allocation of the ARP funds. So can I ask a question? Um, I know that you said that you've already allocated um, and understand what the priorities are because you have to, you know, plan accordingly and you cannot, you know, just pop things into the budget. I understand that. Um, but I'm wondering if some of the things I'm gonna I'm going to bring up fit into these priorities and how you are focusing um, dollars on these issues. Um, some of the things that I'm thinking about is, you know, increasing student engagement, um, you know, having a a uh, close monitor and more, I guess, follow through or, or policy on, you know, chronic absenteeism and truancy. Um, I know that there was a lot written, but I'm not sure about that follow through. And I, you know, I'm aware that um, it was definitely a struggle in that first term back, you know, um, and, and how we're, I'm sure there's still, you know, a domino effect from what's happening going from virtual to you know, in person. Um, and then also how you're addressing the increased support for college preparation and guidance um, or career readiness. Um, because, you know, there was that gap year. I'm sure that there's such a variable in student outcomes during those years in preparation for um, going to two or four year or, you know, vocational um, institutions. I'm wondering how the district is working to increase those supports because you know, it, it's just it's necessary because of the gap um, and because you don't want students to just leave the district. You want them to leave the district prepared um, so that they're able to persist. 
So I'll start with um, with regard to like chronic absenteeism. All of that is baked into the budget for our pupil personnel services. So those increases were accounted for uh, a year ago or so. Um, and so we look and know exactly what that is that we need to increase. So when we talk about professional development, it could be the dollars with regard to professional development that we have included. If it's direct services to students, um, and when I say that, I mean, for example, when our homeschool coordinators are visiting homes and going out on the weekends, that may be overtime dollars that we need to incorporate into you know, that particular budget. So we do have um, a, a significant amount of money that we set aside for overtime and that overtime doesn't just include maintenance in the buildings and on the weekends it includes uh, for example hall monitors and homeschool coordinators when they're doing site visits or when they're making phone calls after hours etc all of those things are baked into that budget so it's not going to be separate it's going to be a part of that. And so when you say, yes, we said that that's what we were going to do, our accountability for that, that is through the PPS report. You'll see that in our board presentations with regard to that. So that accountability is built into the department with these are the expectations. And then here's the metrics that we use to measure that. And those are done on an annual basis. That report is shared with the board. And so those reports can be accessed easily by the public, but we do that monitoring process throughout. Uh, when you talk about um, guidance and career readiness and counselors, et cetera, so we work with um, our counselors, uh, the use of Naviance. We also partner with our higher ed, uh, U, U Albany, uh, St. Rose, Maria College, Sienna. We partner with them with regard to looking at career readiness and things like that, and we do bring in different programs and many of those are um, like in kind services sometimes because it's it's not always a budgetary impact and and some of those gains that we've seen are not in a budgetary impact. It's in a human capital impact where that's where we have our community partners. And, and because we have that partnership, higher ed will come in or even some of our community partners, they'll come in and do various workshops with our students that are not, there's not a dollar value assessed to that because there is no cost. It's an in-kind service that we would do. Um, and, you know, there's a trade-off, you know, they do a presentation, they come and do these services for our students, we do that. Um, so those types of things. We also look at, um, we have a dynamic uh, leadership dashboard that we use for operations. How do we enhance what we do? And I presented this at the board several times with regard to the enhancements of technology that we use. And so that's not a dollar amount to it. It is a system that we built to help our counselors and social workers and behavioral specialists be more effective in what they do in working at the individual level with the student. So everything um, in that respect may not be a dollar amount, but however, when you see the positions, so for example, we may have tutors that we hire, we may have mentors that are part of a, a program that we use, or maybe we get a philanthropic donation to incorporate mentors, et cetera, and then their accountability and progress monitoring where our students are, it happens through that grant. So those things are sometimes accomplished in a, in a different way. Um, I look at the fact that, you know, we have an 82% graduation rate right now. That was our last year's group. That didn't happen by accident. That happened by deliberate intentionality and on purpose with looking at students and what they need individually through the wraparound services. It wasn't by accident that we woke up and all of a sudden we had an 82% graduation rate. That happened over time and each year we have been increasing and each year we've also been closing that achievement gap between our students of color and our white students and we see that gap closing. So when you ask about how those dollars are allocated or accounted for and what we do, that is built into the process and so let's say that we have a contract with a vendor that is working well and they've met their measurable goals and objectives, then the next time that we look to renew that contract, there may be additional services that we use. And so all of that is baked into the process of um, 
what we do for our students and then the different programming options. And then I have to give a shout out to our grants department. Eileen Leffler does an outstanding job. She just did her district update at the last board meeting. You know, we're at over $30 million in grants. Those are not dollars that we have to use out of our general fund to look at how are we preparing our, and we have different grants that address career readiness. We have our 21st century grants, which, which assist with that. Um, so we have, I mean, we are over $30 million in grants that don't impact our general fund. So there are other funding sources that we do look to in order to accomplish the goal of, um, and of, uh, of the school to career um, jobs, looking at jobs, looking at career options, building in those supports for our students. Um, I will mention specifically with chronic absenteeism, we do have um, a grant for that. So you won't see that hit the general fund. You won't see that even itemized there because it's not, it's in a grant. And like I said, those uh, she just did her presentation to the board at the last board meeting um, to look at all the different areas that we address through grants. I have a question about HVAC upgrades. I mean, that seems to be a, a time limited project. How are we doing with that? And what kind of priority do you need for this coming year? For that? So we as an organization front loaded that priority so that most of that work will be completed by December of 2022. Um, we could do that and uh, had a partner who was able to also meet that timeline. So one of the key things that we're doing in that is uh, upgrading and converting our building management system, which will allow us to manage the heating, cooling, ventilation in a very different way. Um, and we are very optimistic about what that means for us as an organization. We have completed uh, three schools. We are preparing to cut over one more school shortly and two schools will start their process on Monday. So we're moving right along. So obviously the reason I'm asking that is I'm looking for money, uh, you know, in terms of whatever you estimated for those HVAC upgrades, I'm assuming you're at budget. Uh, is that something that will drop off if you're saying that you're finished by December 22? Yes, um, that full, the full cost of that was carried in our first year um, because we did obligate by a contract and purchase order. Those dollars um, aligned with that work. So that is actually falling off after this year, even though we won't fully expend the funds until the middle of next year. So is there opportunity to have a, you know, you have four priorities for that priority to switch a little to something else that you could use? The thing I'm thinking about is, um, and again, I understand how much of this is already baked into what you're doing. Um, but one crying need is the diversity of your faculty. And I know you've done a lot of work on that, but is there, are there opportunities of doing some more outreach or training or different programs which may cost some money for that? I know that uh, our director of HR has looked at some of those options and um, some of those things are being incorporated into his operating budget out of the general fund. Okay, so are you asking about, about like, are you trying asking to be about a, a good audience here and a good uh, community person to challenge you about, you know, what you have as your priorities? That's the only reason I'm doing it. So I, I think I need a little clarification on the question. Well, I don't know what the dollars are because right now you've got it as priorities. I mean, we have to look at the a little bit more at the weeds, not all of the weeds, but a little bit more. And I'm just saying that of these four priorities, uh, the one that you may be able to complete uh, is the HVAC upgrade. You know, you're talking about the priorities for spring 2022 and and it may be that for this year you still have to have 
um, that as a priority, but I'm assuming that that's one that eventually you complete and you can, you can drop off and there can be another priority. It's again the use and the comb combining use of state and federal funds or local and you know what I'm saying, ARP funds and your your operational funds. That's all. And you don't have to answer this now. I'm just putting my oar in the water for you to suggest for you to think about it. Thank you for the suggestion. Okay. Um, I have um, a comment about the social emotional learning um, and the safety and security. Um, so I think that the social emotional learning uh, that I've seen happen in the last year has been really positive. And, um, you know, I think some of that is from grants and definitely going in the right direction. Um, I think it is tied that social and emotional learning to safety and security. And when you talk about systems, how you you know build systems, um, like with regards to the college prep, that makes a lot of sense to me. And when I try to think of this in a systems way, um, to me, this harkens to, um, so I am at, have kids at the middle school at the moment, and I'm an officer in the PTA. And I get a lot of comments and what I have mostly heard this year um, does have to do with that what I think is the link between the social emotional learning and the safety and security. Um, and I just wondered in terms of funding. Um, sort of how if those are linked or how those work because. So for instance, having problems with the hard to fill areas, you know, like when there aren't enough hall monitors or TAs, there's just like not enough adults in the building. Kids don't really feel safe. Um, and then it's kind of the same thing at dismissal, right? We don't have resource officers at some of the middle schools, at least problems on the buses. Like what I'm hearing is basically seeming, seems to me like a lack of personnel, which like maybe there's only so much we can do, mm -hmm. but when you don't have actual bodies, um, and I don't know, like maybe there aren't even, you know, there aren't monitors on the middle school buses. Kids don't want to ride the bus. Parents are kind of pulling their kids from the bus, like arranging their family schedule so they can pick their child up from school. You know, and then it's like you look at the numbers. Well, there's not that many kids riding the buses. Is there really a problem? But, you know, there's this like, gap where parents are um, intervening. And I just wonder like can that even though it looks like safety and security it's connected to social and emotional learning like is there any are there any additional resources that could be put towards things like you know a resource officer or taking a closer look at those bus situations or the you know hallway situations um and i i just wondered if there are any plans to take a look at those type of things and how if we could get bodies that might help with the social emotional learning because the kids would feel safer and there might be fewer behaviors. So I'll, I'll address this and it's a bigger, much bigger picture than just saying safety and security and social emotional learning. It, it really is. Um, and, and I won't get on my soapbox about all the societal ills that contribute to that. I, I won't do that. I promise I won't because I could go a long time on how equity in our society impacts what we see every day with our students. I mean, that is probably a lesson in and of itself, but I will definitely keep my comments focused on what you're asking. Um, we have had positions that have been vacant all year because of the labor shortage and people coming into positions. Uh, one of the challenges that we have, and I'm just gonna use um, a very real statistic that we have had to deal with. If we were interviewed, we have interviewed in the upwards of 12 people for positions, thinking that all of those folks would pan out and be just fine moving forward. 
of the 12, four people are able to clear fingerprints and be certified so that they can come and work in our schools among our children. So for every 12 people that are interviewing, I'm averaging hiring four. One of the things that I completely agree with with Commissioner Rosa that we will not have waivers for will be fingerprints and background checks. Won't do it. And, and I totally support that and understand that. I know one of the things that we do talk about is the time frame that it takes to clear people. We would like for that to be a shortened time frame. However, the process that needs to be done, we can't have people slipping through the cracks around our children. And, and so I have to stand by that. Um, so when you look at that's what we're facing for vacant positions, and we've had vacant positions throughout the year, we are just now getting to a point where we have an overflow because people are trying to get jobs now for next year. They're trying to get jobs for next year. And if they can start this year, they can start this year. That's great. It's in a vacant position. We're going to hire them provided they meet the qualifications. That's something I cannot change. And, and that's one of the things that I think even internally, it's very hard when you are you are in the day to day grind and you know that you need five more bodies. But yet you've interviewed X number of people and sometimes it comes back that zero of the people clear in order to be able to work in our schools. So that's a huge challenge. Budgetary wise, we have the positions and the lines there. We are recruiting and I mean, we are putting out, you know, advertisement everywhere to encourage people to come and work. I'm going to talk about the bus aids. Um, we have, since I have been here, we have been trying to get more and more bus aids. It's not a position that many people want to take. It's not. We have done reboots with um, behavioral expectations. We have worked through the disciplinary route of suspending kids from the buses who behave inappropriately. We have worked with families with regard to what that accept individually work with families and with students about what acceptable behavior is on the bus. Um, but I will say it's been very challenging sometimes to even encourage people to want to do that job. So that's something else that is a disconnect. And, and so we are working with that from all angles. Um, when we talk about safety and security with regard to our SROs, uh, we do have school resource officers uh, at the middle school level. We have them at the high school level, but also understand that's also a position that um, we, we have to have people who want to be in that position. And so we know that that is also a very challenging role. Uh, but we have, uh, I think we have about, I think we have two new, um, and don't quote me on that, but I think we have two new um, resource officers, uh, but that's not something that we have. I mean, we don't have, uh, resource officers are not like hall monitors. You know, that is law enforcement. And so we wanna make sure that um, we are, definitely creating those relationships with our police department with regard to our students and how we do those interactions. And our SROs are wonderful. They are absolutely amazing. Um, they do the positive. They do after school activities. They, they build those relationships with our students and we value them. Um, looking at increasing the, the number of SROs, we could absolutely look at putting that in the budget. We've had um, like a neighborhood officer that we have at a couple of our schools. We've looked at increasing those positions and we did not have one person apply for those positions. So, you know, there has to be, despite recruiting, there has to be an interest in those positions as well. And so we have been trying to promote that interest, et cetera. Uh, for people to be a part and join our team with regard to that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's those are tough jobs. Those are very tough jobs. 
And so it, there are a number of challenges, but we are still recruiting. Uh, we, are we are also recruiting in non-traditional ways. We have our HR department uh, working really, really hard with regard to that. And um, we have been conducting interviews nonstop. And so I would say that there are resources that are available that we have dedicated to safety and security. Um, part of the issue is having the bodies to fill the position um, with regard to, you know, who would be interested to do that work. Thank you for everything that the district's doing to try to get them filled. I can see that it's a huge challenge. Um, and yeah, in the meantime, it's a really big juggling act for um, everybody at the schools to try to manage. So I appreciate what everyone is doing. Um, hopefully and the situation at the improves. It, at the end of it, our students are the ones who are in the fray. They're caught in the fray while we work out, you know, the hiring piece, the labor shortages, all those things that kind of extend beyond our control because understand this conversation is not just a conversation here in Albany. It's, it's, we are all competing for the same positions to be filled. And so, and like I said, when I, when we meet, um, we meet almost weekly as superintendents and it's the same conversation uh, throughout, I know at least throughout the capital region, I know firsthand um, through watching the news, secondhand, the state, let alone the country um, that, uh, and, and you have to also understand we have people who are retiring. They have, they have uh, worked for their 20 years or 30 years and they are retiring and they deserve to do that. But on our end, now it's like, Oh my goodness, not only do we have the vacancies, now I need to fill the retirements. Oh my goodness. And so it becomes that, you know, it's that juxtaposition of trying to fill that position, get the people hired, but then also making sure that they meet the qualifications to fill that position. Right. I understand. That's unfortunate. Um, as a follow up question, this is naive, but um, in terms like because you had talked about grants and how we are fortunate to have such a strong grant department and kind of relating to the absenteeism issue that was raised and the safety, security, social, emotional learning. In terms of getting kids to school, I know we have this rule, um, especially for the older kids now about, you know, if you have to be one and a half miles away, but if we were to be able to give bus passes for every student, um, has there been any, like, have we ever looked at that possibility? Like, would it be possible under any circumstance? I have no idea what something like that might cost. Is that something that a grant could cover? Would that be helpful in in any way if kids could just jump on a bus wherever they are in the city? So if we were to reduce the just by half a mile at the elementary level, that's three point three million dollars. That's what it was about a year ago when we looked at this and that's elementary only. So. That is one of the reasons why we looked at trying to impact the law so that there would be state aid funds available for that. As you know, we did get the law. We have the child safety zone, but we don't have the regulations. So our next piece is to work on the regulations and the criteria so that we can absolutely enact the law. Um, but that means that we would have to pay for that ourselves out of the general fund. And for elementary students alone to reduce that bus or reduce the walk zone to one mile, that half a mile is roughly $3.3 million. And so then what does that mean? That means that we would have to look at maybe going out for a referendum. We'd have to look at taxes going up. We don't have all of those, those funds would not be available through ARP or federal dollars because what you're talking about is one-time money and there's no way for us to sustain that. 
So even if we did pull the $3.3 million, we'd be able to do it for a year. And then it goes back to where it is now. And so we have to look at how do we sustain something like that. And, and no, I don't have the figure for high school, um, but I think just the figure for elementary alone, <laughs> It just kind tells of it, all. It, it does. It exactly. tells it all. Yeah. I am going to have to excuse myself because we have our feeder alignment committee meeting tonight and we have our parent forum. And I know that um, Ms. Roaring has a few more slides and with some questions to get through. So I will bid you all good night, but I am jumping on to the next meeting. So thank you all so very much. Um, Tanya, if you could go to our next topic, which is the tax cap calculation. So our tax cap calculation has to be submitted by, to the state comptroller's office by March 1st. The calculation is impacted by multiple variables. One is the tax base growth factor, which looks at growth in the community, and that is determined by the Department of Tax and Finance. Another is the allowable levy growth factor, which is that 2% or less, depending on the calculation. And th that was calculated by the state comptroller's office to be 2%. As we know, inflation is above that. And then looking at the difference between our debt service expense and what our building aid is projected to be for next year. Exclusions are also calculated. The most common is that capital tax levy exclusion. Um, they, OSC will tell us whether or not the teacher's retirement system or employee's retirement system exclusions are able to be taken in a particular year, and that looks at the rate of increase in the percentage of the employer's contribution year over year, and those have not been available for quite some time. When we look at our tax cap calculation going into 22-23, we start with our levy for 21-22, which is $121,259,962. Then we look at our tax base growth factor set by tax and finance, which is 1.0022. We include our pilots receivable, which was 6.9 million. Our capital tax levy exclusion, which again is the difference between our debt service payment and our building aid. Last year that was five, or this current fiscal year, pardon me, it was 5.7 million. And then the allowable levy growth factor set by the state comptroller's office was 2% or 1.02. We estimate our pilots receivable for 22-23, which we are anticipating at this time will be $7.3 million. And we get our tax levy limit before adjustments or exclusions of $117.8 million. When we look at the exclusions, the capital tax levy exclusion for fiscal year 22-23 is expected to be $6.3 million. And that is the difference between our debt service payment of more than $19 million and our estimated building aid, which is around 12 million. Uh, then we are at 6.3. Our levy limit for next year when we include our exclusions is $124.217,337, which is equal to 2.4% over the prior year. Any questions on the tax cap? I just need to understand it. We were at 2%, now we're at 2.4, or am I confusing things? So our, our maximum allowable levy increase is 2.4%, which is based on the, the calculated factors there, the allowable growth factor, the um, okay. by tax and finance, then you have the max by the state comptroller's office, but with the, tax, the capital levy exclusion, that is what allows it to go above 2%. All right, so that, that's our the room that we have before we get into trouble with regard to if our budget is over and above that 2.4. I just wanted to clarify that. Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah. So if the board were to um, decide to go out at that that amount of the 124 million, it would be a 2.4% increase, and that would be a simple majority, so 50% plus one, 
if they sought to raise the levy more than 2.4 percent which would require that super majority so you've got to get at least 60 percent of the vote all right so we what we don't know let's let's go over this <laughs> kind of budgeting 101 we don't know yet what the state legislature will do and it might increase our budget in terms of providing state aid but right now with our modified budget rollover we still need 1.67 million right that and, is correct and that would we we could we could address that i'm assuming relatively easily now that we know that we have a 2.4 percent tax cut if we needed to if we needed yes to. Yes. So 1% on our tax levy is roughly $1.2 million. Got it. Anything else on the tax cut? Okay. Our next steps are to continue to incorporate feedback that we receive, review our projections, budget estimates, and assumptions as we continue to get updated information, and respond to questions that are received. This week, we received some questions from one of our committee members, and I wanted to take a minute to respond to those questions. So it started with special education programming and revenue, and the first question was, does the district only receive reimbursement for support services, such as therapy, speech, occupational, physical, et cetera, of students who are OPWDD or Medicaid eligible? And do we know how much those non-Medicaid reimbursable services cost the district? Medicaid reimbursement applies when the services below are provided, but only if the student is Medicaid eligible and the parent has signed consent for the district to bill and seek reimbursement for provided services. It is not uncommon for students to move on and off of the New York State Medicaid eligibility list during the course of a year. This happens when parents' income no longer qualifies a student for services or the parent does not renew or maintain application for Medicaid. When this happens, we are not able to re be reimbursed regardless of consent as the student is technically not eligible. The district does receive notification monthly of eligible students, which includes both additions and deletions. The services that would be eligible are speech and language, occupational therapy, physical therapy, skilled nursing, psychological counseling, psychological evaluations, speech evaluations, physical therapy evaluations, and occupational therapy evaluations. It is impossible to identify how much revenue is lost due to eligibility factors, as those solely depend on families applying for the service and the qualifying based on. Um, the above, not below. Uh, New York State prescribes eligibility criteria based on several factors, including income. The second question in this area was around district programs falling under BOCES. Um, none of the special education programs provided within one of our school buildings would be considered a BOCES program. All special education programs within the district are run and staffed by our staff. We do sometimes contract with BOCES for itinerant related services to be provided within our district based on student IP needs, which could include teacher of the deaf, orientation and mobility, deaf and hard of hearing interpreter services, but none of these are Medicaid billable. We also contract with BOCES to send students to programs that are available outside of the district. These programs are housed in separate schools, owned or rented by BOCES or in another public school building. Or BOCES rents a physical space, staffs the program, and charges tuition to the home district of the student. BOCES does submit Medicaid claims for district reimbursement when a student is eligible. Anything on either of those before we go to the next topic? Okay. Um, on revenue, why is there an anticipated increase of $430,000 in Medicaid revenue estimated for 22-23? The projection is based on the anticipated receipts for 21-22, considering receipts that should be year to date and expected for the remainder of the year. Um, we are anticipating that increase for 22-23. Why is there an increase in BOCES expenses based on updated information in the modified rollover? We are continuing to receive updated information from BOCES relative to rate increases for specific services and making adjustments to program and services we expect to participate in for 22-23. As the information is received, updates are being made to the modified rollover to make sure that there are, are funds appropriately available. 
What does reviewing projections, budget estimates, and assumptions mean, and what is the process? This is typical in a budget development process, and it occurs as it occurs over several months. The district receives updated cost information from our providers, our insurance carriers, BOCES, and others, and will reflect that in the modified rollover. Total both increases and decreases. We also receive updates from the city assessor's office around our pilot revenue, state aid adjustments from SED, and rebate information associated with our health insurance programs from our third party administrator. The business office staff, including myself, the district treasurer, and the district director of business operations, are primarily responsible for these updates and reviews. On the budget variable si slide, we do note some of these items that are adjusting as we move through the budget development process over that multi month period and when they will be finalized. Some assumptions made this year in the modified rollover are around which programs and positions would be funded by one-time dollars that were funded by one-time dollars in 21-22 could be rolled into the general fund for 22-23. These assumptions are continuing to be reviewed as revenue is updated with the superintendent and cabinet and included in our regular budget updates to the board. So as we continue to refine what the overall revenue projection is for next year, we are reviewing what positions and programs we can bring back into or bring into the general fund and which may be renewed in ARP for another year. And the last question area was around the board audit committee. Um, what is the role and responsibilities of the audit committee? Um, I wanted to share a link in our slide that talks about what those are. Um, School district accountability is pursuant to chapter 263 of the laws of 2005 that do re does require school boards to establish an audit committee. The enacted legislation outlines the roles and responsibilities of that audit committee, the frequency with which they meet, how membership is comprised, etc. It became effective January 1st of 2006, and the primary role of the audit committee is to assist the board in its oversight role in order to ensure financial accountability. The audit committee's charge is enumerated in chapter and should include providing recommendations regarding the appointment of our external and internal auditors, meeting with both our external and internal auditors, reviewing any corrective action plans that need to be put in place and monitoring the completion of those actions, assisting in the oversight of the internal audit function, which is our claims auditor who reviews um, each of the payments before the, the district actually pays our vendors and accounts payable, and reviewing the findings and recommendations of the external and internal auditor. They also monitor, the, as I mentioned, the district's implementation of such recommendations, and then evaluate the performance on the audit function. They also participate in our RFB process every five years um, for internal and external audit services. Board of Education has several policies related to this, and I've noted them there, 6650, 6660. 6680 and 6690, and also uh, included the link at where those could be found for additional information. Are there any questions? Are there any questions you would like to put forward for our next meeting at this time? Well, I, I guess I just would just like to know where we are in the process because now I'm trying to remember when you're going to go out to the community in comparison to what you're going to be talking to us about, because there's still a lot to be discussed, especially the relationship of ARP, for me anyway, the relationship of ARP to the your state budget request. So in other words, could you go over the calendar again? Just yes. in more detail. So we provide our next budget update to the board on March 3rd. Um, we are continuing to review the ARP um, plan for next year and what is going to come into the general fund. That, that review will continue really through the month of March as we wait for our final state aid numbers um, and also receive feedback from the Board of Education relative to the tax levy for next year. Um, all of those things factor into what we can ultimately afford to bring into the general fund and or add to our budget going into next year um, and what we may continue to sustain in ARP. And then we're meeting with the community. We're meeting with the community when? The virtual community budget presentation is scheduled for March 24th. 
um, which is two weeks in advance of when we will present the, the proposed budget to the board. So we'll have the opportunity to answer any questions that the community members may have or post to us that day or in advance, as well as um, get their feedback. Thank you. Any other questions or requests for the next meeting? For me, if I have any questions, I'll send an email, I suppose. OK, please do feel free to do that. I'm happy to respond. <laughs> OK, well, hearing none other, I will um, adjourn us for this evening. Thank you so much for your time this evening, and I look forward to seeing you on the 28th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.